the Bible is a lie. We need another Holocaust. And with me is uh, Reverend Steve, the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, um, writer, statesman, raconteur, and man about town. And I mean, you and you do awesome, awesome jazz hands. Yes, I do. I do awesome, awesome jazz hands, like Wolf Cop. Yeah, that. Yeah, that that. You don't mention that enough, and I think it's really holding you back. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. should, I should put that on my resume. If you were at work in the Barnes and Noble and you did jazz hands more often, people would ask you for help. To be fair, though, just I really like covering my bases uh, on the internet. So let's not say what company I may or may not work for. Oh. Okay. Let's just say that I work for a seller of books. A seller of books. And we can just leave it at that. I mean, there are so many different types of bookstores out there that people really can't put two and two together. But I am in no way representative of any major organization. And I am not no. saying that because uh, they forced me to say that a long time ago. <laughs> Way before they decided to update their uh, employee manuals on um, how this whole internet thing is kind of popular. So let's just say I work for a corporation and we can just kind of drop it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. We were going to record this episode a few days ago, but it got postponed because my uh wife got very very sick and she started vomiting all over the place and so i was wondering should i tell the story or should i not tell the story and i was kind of debating it but then i realized that my wife has never listened to this podcast <laughs> and i doubt she ever will it's got uh, vomit in it so you got to tell the story it, my my wife uh she has a hard time staying still for things so I, I I don't think she has the patience for like a two hour long podcast on Oogie Love. So I'm pretty sure I'm safe to tell this story. Um, my wife has had her new job for quite some time. Um, she was going to be part time being the head cook slash dietitian at an old folks home. She was going to be part time every once in a while. But once she started, they said, OK, well, this person was just fired and this person quit and this person only has two weeks. So, hey, guess what, Natasha, you're in charge now and you're working full time. And then at around about that same time, I went from being a part time seller of books to a manager type person. And so I'm working like crazy. So we don't get a lot of time to see each other. And every once in a while, I won't get the most sleep in the world because I know I should go to sleep because I have to work early. But at the same time, my wife is exists. Right. And so sometimes I just want to stay up and actually spend some time with this person. So um, 
the last two weeks, we have actually had one day off together, and it's been a really big deal for us because that's ne never happened before. And so it happened two weeks ago, and then it happened again this past week, and we were really excited. And for whatever reason, Natasha said, okay, Monday night, you know, I'll be home, and you'll be coming off of work, so I've got this great idea. Let's just stay up, and we can watch bad movies, and we can talk, and we can hang out, and uh, I'll make white Russians. She just got white Russians in her head, right? She just said, white Russians, we got to get white Russians. First, we got to go and buy stuff for white Russians. So let's go and buy stuff for white Russians. And we went to this um, sketchy liquor store here in uh, Shawnee, Oklahoma. Uh -huh. There's a lot of liquor laws here in Oklahoma. And it's really weird so if you go to a liquor store, nothing can be cold. It all has to be room temperature. Okay. And they all have to close at a specific time, and they can't be open on Sundays because of g -shish. So we went to this weird, sketchy place, and you know what they had there at the liquor store? What did they, they have had, there? They had root beer schnapps. Okay. They had root interesting. Beer, they had root beer liquor, and we didn't buy it. I just took a bunch of pictures and got really excited for what is eventually going to be the greatest root beer show ever. Yes. Because that's going to be awesome. I did not know they made liquor root beer, so I got quite excited. So we bought all this stuff for white Russians, and we were going to make white Russians, but um, we're also getting older. Yeah, that's... So isn't doesn't it suck? Yeah, so we were asleep at around ten o'clock. <laughs> Just knocked out. So when so when our actual day off came along, we woke up and we we're like, ah, damn it! They there went our whole plan because we were tired. And so Natasha just said, well, let's just let's wake up. Let's get everything done that we're supposed to today, and then we'll come home and 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 then I'll make white Russians. So we were drinking white Russians at around one o'clock in the afternoon and good. Um, good, good, good. so she made this super strong white russian for herself and then when it was time to make a white russian for me i said honey now remember i'm a wuss so don't make me a strong one so she made me this really weak one and i was drinking it and it, it, it tasted wonderful and i loved it but apparently she made hers way too strong okay so by the time we were set to record the podcast, I had my new job of hair holder. Ah, so that's what had her throwing up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so weird because she she apparently when she gets uh drunk, she she's a lot more passable than I am. When I'm drunk, I, I, I talk a lot louder and I'm slurring stuff and I keep saying the same things over and over again. And I get kind of some or sometimes I'll just get really quiet and I'll hang out in the corner by myself and I'll get sleepy. But she gets very she is a very normal, passable sort of a person, because before she was drinking, she was installing shelves throughout our house just just putting in shelving units okay while while drinking yeah yeah she was drinking and she was just oh man we need more shelves i need to let me let me let me where's my power tool i need to put this <laughs> shelf up oh wait i should put another shelf in wait where does this screw go and then five seconds later she's vomiting and she's like oh god i'm so sick i i, I drank too much and i'm like really because five seconds ago you were you were uh bob veeling the house <laughs> like five freaking seconds ago you were you were you you got all like sh like you were doing shelf porn over here and now you're vomiting like crazy. You are a much better drunk than I am. Because all I want to do when I drink that much is to do karaoke somewhere. But apparently, uh, she's a lot better than I am at drinking, I guess. But ah. So that was my few days ago. And she, it was funny because she's, she's vomiting and then she's like, 
honey, I'm sorry about the Oogie Loves. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, me too. It's a really horrible movie, but what's your point? <laughs> remind me, remind me. I've got um, homework for next week. Okay, good. Last Friday, Jeannie gets home early, which yeah. is which is kind of a shock right there. Okay. So it's like, okay, well, you're home early. It's Friday night. Let's go out to dinner, and then after that, we were going to go see a, a friend of ours play at a local coffee house. Okay. So we go up to one of our favorite restaurants. It's called the Mason Jar. It's like the next step above, like, Denny's or Chili's or anything like that, you know? Okay. Um, it's not a chain or anything like that. Basically, basically, uh, you know, standard food. Okay. Um, so we're in there. We order our meal. We're sitting back. We're relaxing. And suddenly we notice the restaurant is full. And I mean full of Santa Clauses. Oh, God. There had to be like 50 Santa Clauses. Just packed in. Was it one of those Santa Claus fight clubs I've heard so much about? I, I think it might have been. I didn't get to talk to any any of the particular Santa Clauses for very long. And it was like, you know, God damn it. We need to bring our camera everywhere. You know? Did you sit on Did you sit on any of their slaps? Uh, no, but but we did find that they were meeting at the Franciscan Church on the next morning, so we tried chasing them down, and the Catholics would not allow us in. Nice. Because <laughs> they thought we would do something completely nefarious in filming and speaking to Santa Clauses. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's a darn shame. That you what that you weren't able to catch up to the Santa Clauses. Yeah, we took a lot of footage. We like drove around all day, just taking footage and stopping and just jumping out of the car and asking people if they believe in Santa Claus and getting back in the car and driving away. And uh, I'm hoping I have enough footage for like a little mini documentary of the event. And then just sell it to Netflix because I've seen worse stuff than that on Netflix. Speaking of which, have you seen the, uh, the the Mick Foley Santa Claus documentary? No, no, I haven't. Oh. I, I Mick Foley is a very talented man, but I've I've read two or three of his books, so I know how obsessed he is with Christmas and Santa Claus. So I've kind of sort of purposefully stayed away from the Mick Foley Santa Claus documentary. Because I just don't want to be creeped out by Mick Foley. He's a really he's a really nice guy, and he's he's smart, and he's a wonderful writer, and he was a a, a damn good wrestler. So the last thing that I want to do is sully any of that <laughs> by watching the Mick Foley Santa Claus documentary. I don't even think it's on Netflix anymore, but it was pretty oh. awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. I wow. have got. An R-rated got, documentary on Santa Claus. <laughs> I've got two. I I'm I'm staring at my my notes here. I have got two and a half pages on the Oogie Loves, and that is frightening. On the bottom of the first page, the last thing that I wrote on this first page of notes on the Oogie Loves is, "Holy crap! I just filled an entire page with notes on the Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure." What is wrong with my life? What is wrong with my head? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Like, I think I know this movie better than the people who made this movie. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting that uh, your notes on a podcast can also serve as your suicide note. Yes, yes, very much so. So you might very, want to keep it around. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to save all of these notes because, like you said, there, there's something very visually bizarre about about these notes. Oh, your your, your notes look, they just look visually very awesome. Yeah, yeah, they look pretty weird. I've got, I've got, a, I've got a, two 
I've got a couple of different lists here. I've been trying to to come up with interesting like lists. Well, I thought I I want to mention it right now because we were talking about Netflix, but I won't read the list. I just want to mention the list. I have a list of the biggest box office bombs of all time. Okay. And it's cool. it's the the 10 biggest box office bombs ever not adjusted for inflation but i'm almost positive that all 10 of these movies are available on netflix and i'm pretty sure that says something <laughs> uh did you do the homework this week oh yes i did the homework this week the homework this week was good homework because it took about uh exactly two and a half minutes it was good, good homework. The homework for this week was... The trailer was... for the movie, Free on a Meat Hook. I was kind of hoping that this would be some sort of prequel to Three Men and a Baby. Oh, wouldn't but that be not. cool? But it was not. So, Three on a Meat Hook, the movie itself is a low budget, extremely low budget grindhouse movie from 1972. It's loosely based on Ed, Ed Gein. Is that how you pronounce the serial killer's name? Or would, is it Gein? I, I would usually pronounce it Gein. That's how okay. I've always heard it. Well, it, it, it's interesting because three on a meat hook, there are one or two scenes that look exactly like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes. And... Uh, and the movie is loosely based on the life of Ed Gein, just like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And this movie came out a year before the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be interesting, uh, that Three on a Meat Hook might be uh, the precursor to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I found that this was interesting. The movie was directed by William Girdler. And I thought that I had heard that name before, so I, uh, I looked him up. He directed the movie Abby, which I always wanted to see because it's a black exorcist. I have not heard of it. And the name, the name William Gerb Gerbner, I can't say it, is familiar to me as well. I, I'm not sure why. It's not well, Abby, though. He made Grizzly. He made Grizzly. That would be it. The Jaws ripoff. I got to see that in the theater thanks to, uh, thanks to the, the trash film orgy, the bizarre film festival that they have in Sacramento. So yeah, 1976 Grizzly actually kind of somewhat successful ish. Definitely a uh, William Girdler's biggest film, but the guy, William Girdler, he died at age 30. He, he died in a helicopter crash in the Philippines while scouting locations for his next movie. He made nine films in a very small amount of time. Uh, and that's a darn shame that he died so young because he made nine films in about a decade, so um, do you have what? It's else a you darn have? shame. Um, one or two other black exploitation films, and um, that I had never heard of, but mostly like small, low budget grindhouse sort of a thing. Yeah, you know. But um, that's all about the movie Three on a Meat Hook. And the movie is free on YouTube, and that might be a, a, a bizarre, fun little thing to watch. But the... I've, I've never seen the movie, uh, and I might have to watch it just because I love this fucking trailer so goddamn much. Well, the trailer is one of the most poetic trailers that I've ever seen in my life. Because the movie, you can barely see it. It's like every every scene in the movie is... Like, like, um, like Mystery Science Theater said about uh, 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 Manos, the Hands of Fate, every scene in Three on a Meat Hook looks like someone's last known photograph. Yes. Like Zap Ruder filmed Three on a Meat Hook. He was the cinematographer for Three on a Meat Hook. You can't really see anything that's going on. It looks extremely low budget. So for the trailer, they got some a deep voiced guy to spout off some serious poetry 
It's one of the most poetic trailers that I've ever seen. And I, I, I uh, wrote down some of the lines that I liked from the trailer. Um, the twilight areas of a life destined to be spent in shadow and agony. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. And you're watching the trailer and it's like this movie looks like shit. But I want to see the movie that that dude is talking about. A secret conspiracy of suspicion and fear dwelling like a lodger in the mind. I I, I hope you have my favorite. These could all be really good. I I don't know if I I do now. Now I'm I'm feeling pressure. I hope you have my favorite. Uh, I also liked. Oh, probably. Yeah. Then maybe I do. Um, I like the fact that this movie holds a black light at childhood. (laughs) (laughs) A stolen life pawn to a godless oblivion. Like you stole a life and then you decided to sell it in a pawn shop called Godless Oblivion. (laughs) That would be an awesome name for a pawn shop too, now that I think about it. Yeah. That would be really, really good. Um... Uh, suspended in time by a puppeteer with blood on his hands. Little broken dolls that go on dancing after the music has stopped. <laughs> Drops Mike right there. Drops Mike walks away. Three on a meat hook, bitches! The, the movie he is talking about sounds so much more gothic. You know, I, I could picture yeah. that movie being in just a big castle you know I think, yeah wolves, and i can picture being wolves <laughs> and i can picture all of those lines all of those bits of dialogue being lines in songs written by bands who i don't care about <laughs> dream theater dream theater those are all lines from a dream theater song I had an ex who was really big on dream theater. Yeah. This is like the best homework that I ever did because you assigned me homework and then uh, I, I did it immediately. I just did it immediately. Like once we stopped recording last week's, I, I just went, oh, this will be easy homework. Hey, honey, sit down. We're going to watch the preview for three on a meat hook. Well, I felt it would go really, really well with Oogie Loves. Yes, very much so. In fact, you know what would be fun to get the trailer for to get the movie Oogie Loves and kind of slow it down, put it in black and white, and then over that put the dialogue from the trailer Three on a Meat Hook. So you have like the three Oogie Loves bicycling in slow motion, suspended in time by a puppeteer with blood on his hands. Oh, I might have to that you know and you see like schloofy little broken dolls <laughs> that's a that's a money idea right there you just see poor uh you see poor jamie presley and christopher lloyd like doing mariachi dancing a secret conspiracy of suspicion and fear <laughs> a great idea Bring the both of these together in one beautiful, beautiful way. I, I ah. might have to give that a try. That's a really good idea. I don't think it would take that long. I'm just going to mention it right now. I'm just going to mention it right now because I don't want to forget. I have homework for next week. Okay. What you got? And I'm really, I'm really excited about it. Something tells me you may already know about this sort of a thing, about this specific thing it's a cartoon my kids have all seen it about a bajillion times and it's available all over youtube bella's here and this has piqued her interest it's a cartoon from 1931 old black and white cartoon called bimbo's initiation i was gonna say dora no no not dora Dora. (laughs) if it was then it would uh, it would be. Dora is slightly less uh, frightening than Bimbo's initiation. No, hey. it's more frightening. Uh, no, it's not. I would Bella, say it's, it's Bella, 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 
we've got my nine-year-old daughter Bella here on the show right now. Bella, do you know what cartoon is Bimbo's initiation? Ugh. Well, let me let me give you a clue. Let me give you a clue, okay? Want to be a member? Want to be a member? Yes. Oh, yeah, you know what cartoon I'm talking about now, don't you? Yeah. The cartoon with all the death and murder and Betty Boop as a dog. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'm not sure if I know that one, but I am very familiar with Bimbo. Yeah, well, I've got a... It, there's about a bajillion different uh, uploads on YouTube, but I found a really nice one that's really high quality. And uh, I'll send you the link and we can post it because there's a it, it, it's the most it's essentially saw for kids. <laughs> Let me run through the plot with you right now. It Bimbo's my- walking down the street. Yeah. Bimbo the dog. And then suddenly Mickey Mouse appears and uh, drops him into a manhole where he uncovers a secret society and they want Bimbo to be a member. Bimbo says no, so they keep trying to kill the fuck out of him. So it's Scientology? Kind of. <laughs> kind of. It, it's considered the the most notorious Fleischer cartoon ever created. And it was uh, the last one to feature Betty Boop as a dog. Betty Boop used to be a dog. I yes. guess well, well, five stars. Bimbo, Bimbo is too. a dog. And then Betty Boop was his girlfriend. His dog girlfriend, yeah. but then Betty Boop got huge. So then they turned Betty Boop into a human. But then suddenly, the, what the Hayes Code came along, the Motion Picture Production Code came along, and they said, "Well, you guys can't date because she's a human and he's a dog, and that's bestiality." So they got rid of Bimbo, and that's a darn shame. And it's beautiful, beautiful bestiality. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, next week. Bimbo's initiation. A lot to talk about. It's it's a I, small, very small cartoon, but it's the best cartoon ever created. I, I am very excited about that because that is most likely now going to become uh, an episode of uh, Bob's Dirty Shorts, the director's cut. Yes, yes, very much so. That's, very that's much the so. exact kind of cartoon I'm looking for yeah. for that show. I really liked the, the one you just did with um, Duck and Cover. I love that cover. cover. I I found this album somewhere, and I'm not sure where, but it it was essentially a bunch of uh, uh, DJs and techno artists and whatever doing remixes of Duck and Cover. (laughs) And so every once in a while, I'll be listening to my music on my phone, and some Duck and Cover themed song sampling Duck and Cover will come along, and the kids will get all excited, and the kids all know Duck and Cover. So when the nuclear war happens, my family will be safe Yes, because of Bert the Turtle, <laughs> who has taught these kids that all you have to do is duck and cover or perhaps cover yourself with a wet newspaper and you'll be absolutely safe <laughs> from the nuclear fallout. But, but I, I've got to take this time to say I, I really, really, I hate YouTube. Really? I hate YouTube, yeah. Because that episode, uh, along like many of the episodes of the director's cut, they flagged it for copyright infringement yeah. because, because of Duck and Cover. Duck That's and Cover ridiculous. is public domain. Mm-hmm. They, they, they do not, they don't give a shit about their content providers. Yeah. And I find that really annoying. And it doesn't make a difference what you put in if somebody says, if somebody oh. says, oh, that's ours, that's it. You can file a dispute form and never hear a damn thing back from them, ever. That is weird. This is, <laughs> Duck and Cover is a government-produced public service message. Uh-huh. Okay? That is always public domain. That is uh-huh. our tax money. Yeah. Nobody owns that. We all own it. But that doesn't make a difference. They just flag it, and that's it. So, yep, ridiculous. But that was a good episode. I like that episode. Good, thank you. Well, well, well. 
damn it, I guess we got to get into this thing. Yeah, if we're going to get into into Oogie Loves, I really kind of have to start with, you know, just just fuck you. Just fuck <laughs> you, Mr. Galindo. <laughs> this is an amazing movie. This I, is an amazing movie. I, I actually didn't hate it. I say that more more for the fun of it. You know, it, it was a bizarre little trip. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Go Carrie Elways was in this. Oh Carrie Elways was in this. God, and he looked awful. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. What the hell happened to him? <laughs> hey, 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 I also wanted to say I really liked the um station identification things. Oh, you listened to them? Created. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah, we're going to have to remember to take at least one break somewhere along in the show, and I'll, I'll cut one of them in. Okay, well, why don't we take a break right now? Because we're about to start the movie. And uh, this would be a good place to pause for station identification. That sounds like a great idea. Okay. So we'll be right back, America and other countries that don't count as much. War to talk to us. Pope on film, like our Facebook page, by searching Pope on film. Pope on film! You can follow us on Twitter at Pope on film. Or email us at Pope at undeadcow.com. Not sure how to listen? Well, just find us in the iTunes store by searching Undead Cow. <laughs> All one word. And you know, if, if you're really hard, hard up, you can always find us on Stitcher and of course YouTube at youtube.com slash users slash our dead cow film. I gotta go home and try to talk my girlfriend into an abortion. Very much shame now. Never cried. I'm gonna let go of my high school days. I am. And we're back. Thank you for joining us. Maxwell, say thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Bella. <laughs> Maxwell, Maxwell just headbutted the podcast. <laughs> Are you okay, Maxwell? I'm okay. Okay, you know whose fault that was? What? The Oogie Loves. It was the Oogie Loves' fault. Do you know who the Oogie Loves are? Oh. Exactly. You don't know who the Oogie Loves are. There, my my wife gave me a specific rule that a, okay, you're gonna do the Oogie Loves, fine, but you cannot watch this around Maxwell because <laughs> there would be a possibility that he would like it, and if he likes something, he wants to watch it again and again and again. There are days when he watches Dumbo like two or three times a day, so. <laughs> So a, the last thing that we wanted was for him to get obsessed with the Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure, which but, is our movie this week. But you just raised a very, very important question that I think we need to address, and that is, does anybody truly know who the Oogie Loves are? I know who they are. They're Toofy, Gooby, and Zuzi. And they live in Lovey Loveville, which, as everyone knows, is in Indiana. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Everybody knows that. So where, the where love is carefully restricted. Yes. Yes, very much so. The Oogie Loves is a 2012 family movie that um, uh, holds the record for the biggest box office bomb of all time. Technically, it's not the biggest box office bomb of all time, but it's the biggest box office bomb of all time for movies released in at least 2,000 theaters. Okay. But, but technically, it is not the biggest bomb ever, which brings me to my list. 
Right. Of biggest box office bombs of all time. I read this to my wife and she was quite surprised. She was quite surprised at some of the movies that were on this list. Now, this list of biggest box office bombs of all time, this is not adjusted for inflation. If it's adjusted for inflation, the number three and number one switch places. But anyway, uh, the, the number one biggest box office bomb of all time, I did not know that this was so unsuccessful, but it's 2013's Keanu Reeves' uh, Japanese phase movie, 47 Ronin. Really? I had no idea that that did that bad. I, 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 I did not know that it did that bad either, uh, especially since I haven't seen the movie, but uh, my man crush, Adam Warrock, did a wonderful song about it. Ah. And it's funny because he hadn't actually seen 47 Ronin, but he wrote a song about it anyway. <laughs> okay. It's a really good song. I really, really like it. But um keanu reeves all brooding and he's in japan and ronin's 47 of them maybe 46 and then he becomes the 47th i don't know but the movie cost 225 million dollars to make oh man and worldwide it made um 150 million dollars see hollywood just does not know what they're missing okay they really don't because you give me that money, I'll make 235 movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or more. <laughs> That's how I felt about um, Evan Almighty with uh, Steve Carell. Because they, they built an actual arc and they used actual animals. And it's just, you don't have to do that. You didn't need to spend $100 million building an ark, and you didn't have to spend $100 million hiring all of these animals. We don't care. <laughs> just just write a good script and then put Steve Carell in it. You didn't have to go that extra mile. But anyway, um, apparently 47 Ronin really hurt Universal, and it took them a long time to bounce back from that. Like, I... I the film looked okay. I didn't know that it did so bad that it was on the top of this list. Anyway, number two, uh, I've seen number two, and eh, it's okay. It's from 2011. It's a Disney movie. It's called Mars Needs Moms. I uh, Yeah, that's familiar. I've never seen it. Well, yeah. it's... It's based on a kid's book that was written by um, the guy who did Bloom County. Burke Burke. Reeves? Yeah. Yeah, he wrote a number of kids' books, and this was one of them, Mars Needs Moms. And so they decided to make a movie based on it. But instead of just making an animated movie, they spent way too much money on this very expensive motion capture system where they got all of the voice actors and they put these expensive suits on them. And then, then they they built this world around them. But it again, not necessary. Yeah, no, not for a movie like that. It cost $150 million to make, and worldwide it made uh, $38 million. And it really hurt Disney. I'm just kidding. That was a drop in the bucket. But still, it... Yeah. Like, nothing can Disney right now. No. Disney, is, Disney is like the Catholic Church of movies. What? Ten more kids uh, sexually assaulted? Whatever. <laughs> The number three uh, biggest box office bomb of all time is from 1999, and it's called The 13th Warrior. Antonio Banderas. Warrior, yeah? Yeah. Based on a Michael Crichton book, and it, the only thing that I, I haven't seen the movie, but from what I remember from previews and seeing it on TV and stuff, it seems as if 50% of the movie is in the rain. Uh, a good I may be wrong rain. about that. Uh, it, it just seems to me. It's not a bad movie. It's certainly not the greatest movie ever made, but it's watchable and it's entertaining. It cost $160 million to make in 1999. 
which is why when adjusted for inflation, this is absolutely number one, because it made $6 million worldwide and apparently wasn't the biggest uh, movie in the world. That's Num pretty surprising, actually. Yeah. yeah. Especially, it's a, it's based on a Michael Crichton book, for Christ's sake. Yeah. That dude's money. A lot of people like that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Number four, Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger, the new one? The one yes. That just came out? Okay. New one. The, the movie that made everybody want to give Johnny Depp a hug and say, hey, it's okay. So you make a couple of really bad movies over and over again in a row throughout the span of five or ten years. It's okay. It happens to everybody. What's Eddie Murphy doing? Yeah, exactly. I, I've, I've, again, I've heard a lot of people enjoyed that movie. I haven't seen it. I want to. It's on my Netflix list, as is a lot of movies on this list. That's suspicious. And there was another Lone Ranger movie made back sometime in the 80s, I believe. Yeah, and it was like a modern-day sort of a take on the Lone Ranger, I think. Uh, no, not really. It, no? was, it was still a no? Western. And um, Christopher Lloyd played uh, Bruce Cavendish. <laughs> the Lone Ranger played Christopher Lee Lloyd? Yeah. Christopher Lloyd, who are you talking about? Oh, wait a second. You mean... Uh, Lero Sombrero. Lero Sombrero. Yes, I do. Okay. You say Christopher Lloyd. I'm like, who? You say Doc Brown. I'm like, excuse me, but Lero Sombrero. Okay, then. <laughs> that I understand. Speaking my language now. It's surprising that the Lone Ranger did so bad because it's the you, Johnny Depp is teaming up with the same people who made Pirates of the Caribbean and, like, on paper... The Lone Ranger looks like a, a big, big hit. But I, I think that this is uh, the fault of, of uh, the Disney marketing machine because the movie cost $225 million to make. But marketing, they spent over $150 million marketing this thing. So technically, the entire movie cost well over $375 million. And there's no way that you're going to make that. At all. Yeah. Unless you throw in like some Avengers in there. Like Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Captain America or something. I don't know. But it made $260 million, and that's a good amount of money if you hadn't spent over $150 million marketing the movie. Yeah. It, it strikes me that it may have failed pretty much for the same reason that caused like Speed Racer to fail where yeah. all of the advertising kind of presents one type of movie, and then when you watch the movie, it's really something else. Yes. So yes, if, yes. If, yes. If the advertising brings you into the theater, you're going to be disappointed, and you're not going to like it, because it's not representing the movie correctly. <laughs> I was so excited to go and see uh, Sweeney Todd in theaters. Because I knew for a fact that 75% of the people in the theater had no clue that it was a musical. <laughs> and I was so excited. Apparently, my brother went to go see it in this really bad neighborhood in, uh, uh, like, Mesa, Arizona. Like, a really bad neighborhood. And people were just yelling at the screen. And they were like, what? This is a fucking musical. Oh, this is bullshit. And like leaving and asking for their money back. Oh, it was wonderful because the previews never said a thing. Yeah. Oh, I was also a little bit worried about Into the Woods because they also had the same sort of previews where there's a, like, hey, look, Anna Kendrick and uh, other people. And maybe they're singing. Maybe they're not. Who knows? <laughs> you know? Ah! I was really excited to see that. Number five um, is from 2013. A lot of these are recent. A lot of these movies on the top 10 list are very, very recent. Um, and this one is from 2013. It's called R.I.P.D. With G. 
Jeff Bridges kind of yeah. Thing. Mm, sort of a Men in Black ripoff. Yeah, an awful lot like Men in Black. It's based on a comic book that no one had ever heard of. Um, a huge Men in Black sort of ripoff. It cost um, over $158 million to make, and worldwide it made $78 million, but that's because it was super crazy heavy on special effects. Yeah, Like super crazy heavy special effects. It seems like some studios, you know, in in their mad rush to grab uh, the next big like comic book franchise, like uh-huh. they don't stop to like read the comic book, you know, to find out. Yeah. Issue. So it's like it's like Fritz the Cat. This this is an interesting comic book. The kids will love this. It's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh Number six, uh, six through ten, I don't have too much uh, information on these movies, but they're all movies that you, you pretty much kind of sort of know about. Uh, number six, John Carter. John Carter was fun. I, I, I haven't seen it. It really didn't. The, it didn't seem like there was any reason for me to, to see this. I just didn't didn't care too much to. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, again, another movie that was kind of like mishandled, I would say, because it it was it was a fun movie. It wasn't it wasn't like bad, like Flash Gordon or anything like that. You know, but yeah, they they didn't know how to advertise it because it was, of course, it was originally John Carter of Mars, and then suddenly they were like, oh, well, we we can't use Mars. Nobody will go to a movie if Mars is in it. <laughs> yeah, they should have called Mars Attacks just Attacks. Yeah. And really, a movie called John Carter. Oh, man. <laughs> I really want to go see John Carter. Number seven is a movie that I liked. Uh, Jack the Giant Slayer. That's, that was from like a year or two ago. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. I saw I saw the cheap asylum knockoff of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, 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 2013 it stars um what's the name of that British guy? It it stars the guy who was the zombie in um Nicholas Holt. That's his name. Nicholas Holt. He was in that zombie movie that I really really liked, Warm Bodies. Oh, and he's a uh, he's he's Beast in all of the new X Men movies. Oh, okay. He Jack the Giant Slayer also had a uh, Ian McGregor in it. Ian. <laughs> it was an okay movie. It was pretty good. Uh, very British. I I really liked the movie, but I'm worried that the only reason I liked the movie was because I saw it in a drive-in. That helps. And I love- I love drive-in so much that I'm not sure if it's possible for me to hate a movie I see at the drive-in. <laughs> so, it, it, Warner Brothers, it, it was a, it, I, it was, it's, it's a good movie. Number eight, I, I'm, I was really excited about the 2005 film Sahara. That's not even ringing a bell. Uh, Matthew McConaughey. Uh, Steve Zahn, Penelope Cruz. It's based on the book uh, Sahara by Clive Cussler. And it, it's the first book in a big, long series centered around um, his character, uh, Matthew McConaughey's character. He plays Dirk Pitt, kind of like a modern day Indiana Jones adventurer sort of a person. Um, so Clive Cussler, he, he, this Dirk Pitt series of books, they're huge, massive Massive bestsellers, and the studio that made this movie, they thought, okay, well, since uh, Clive Cussler has made so many books, we're going to make this movie. It's going to be huge. Then we're going to make a sequel and another sequel and another sequel, but this movie absolutely bombed. So Clive Cussler sued the makers of the movie. Okay. 
because they said, oh, well, my books are bestsellers. And now this movie bombed. So people aren't buying my books enough. And the problem is because you didn't consult me on the script. So I'm suing you guys for making a bad movie of my wonderful book. So then the People who made the movie countersued Clive Cussler and said that he tried to sabotage the movie because they didn't consult him on the script. And the the lawsuit went on for for quite a while. Like um, he, he, Clive Cussler um, took legal action in February of 2005 and the the whole court case just went on and on and on. They they were calling it the bad movie court case because the poor jury, they had to keep watching the movie. <laughs> oh, man. And going to like places where they shot the movie like I, I oh, man, I want to be on a jury so bad and I want to be on this one. <laughs> so then eventually they they like Clive Cussler was a was a was supposed to pay the makers of the movie $5 million. Really? Yeah. So then Clive Cussler said, oh, well, I'm going to, what's that word where they're, I'm going to appeal. So then on the appeal, Clive Cussler had to pay $13.9 million in legal fees to the people who made the movie. So then in 2010, another appeal overturned both of the other things. It, it, it's a it's a big, huge thing. There are whole websites that are devoted to the Sahara lawsuit. It's it's quite amazing. Absolutely amazing. And a lot more fun to talk about than the Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon movie. So, yeah, uh, the number nine biggest box office bomb is stealth uh jamie fox like a yes and bomb. an intelligent and an intelligent stealth bomber that comes to life and tries to kill him the interesting thing about the movie stealth is that they made the movie and then they said oh man this is a really bad movie let's not release it and then jamie fox went and won an oscar for his performance as ray charles so then the studio said, OK, well, you remember that movie we made three years ago that we've been sitting on? It has Jamie Foxx and he's huge now. Let's release the movie. And Jamie Foxx is like, ah, shit, you're really you said you weren't going to release that. <laughs> and then the number 10 uh, biggest box office bomb of all time, The Adventures of Pluto Nash. I'm surprised, actually, that there are not more Eddie Murphy movies on the top 10 list of biggest box office bombs of all time, because he has made some bad ones. What happened to him, man? He was so big. He was huge. Yeah. I do not know. But that is my list of the biggest box office bombs of all time. But. Were you going to say something? Yeah, uh, I, I was just before we leave this. Stealth really, you know, what you just said about stealth reminds me a lot of like Johnny Mnemonic, because that's pretty much yeah. the same thing that happened there. It was made before the Matrix, and it sucked, so we're not going to release it. And then the Matrix was huge, you know. So this was by the same author. It has Keanu Reeves, and they put it out. I want, I want to remake Johnny Newman, but I want it to be about a medical student who's having problems memorizing things. <laughs> yes. So then he just comes up with mnemonic devices to memorize things. Maybe it's the story of the first person who came up with mnemonic devices and his name is Johnny Newmonic. That's a good idea. I like that idea. But... Talking about box office bombs really makes me, and this is a big, this is a big deal for me, care about math. Because I fucking hate doing math. I absolutely hate math. There's no more I can say. I just, I fucking hate math. I'm really bad at math. I don't like math. I, 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 I just... 
I, I have a hard time with math, period. I just, I hate it. I fucking hate math. But bad movie math, that I can do. And I've got some really good bad movie math for the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. So, oh, nice. okay. today's film, let's break down the numbers. The Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure cost $20 million to make. Um, I, and marketing was double that. Marketing was $40 million. They spent $40 million. $40 million marketing the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And I believe that because when, when I go to the movie, when I go to a movie theater, one of the things that I like to do either before the movie or after movie, I like to explore the theater. I like to walk around, check out the movie posters, see what's going on, see what movies are coming up. I like to explore the theater. And I remember one time when the whole family went out to a movie that suddenly there was this big, huge, giant, corrugated display for the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. But there were buttons that you pressed that were next to each character and when you pressed it then that character started talking to you in a really weird creepy voice and i said oh this is fucking creepy what the hell is the oogie loves in the big balloon event i do not know what this is but i will remember that name the oogie loves in the big balloon adventure and i remember thinking later how much did it cost them to make these big giant displays i think they had lights too that talk to you. I've never seen that before. And this must have cost them a lot of money. Apparently it cost them $40 million. So uh, the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure, it opened on August 29th, 2012, and it opened at number 17 in the box office. And, and it may be me. It may be my fault. I, you know, maybe I'm just overthinking things, but I was, I was really, really disappointed in the title of this movie. The Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure? Yes. Yes, The Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. Because I was expecting a big balloon. No, it was a big adventure that had to do with balloons. I know. But no, there was a big balloon in this. Should that, have that had is, a big balloon. It's a good point. It's a good point. But the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure was released in 1, 2,160 theaters across America. And on the first day, it made $102,000, $102,564. So if you do the math there, the per theater average for this movie uh, on its first day was $47. Each theater that played the Oogie Loves made $47 <laughs> on average That's for really that. Yeah. The whole weekend, it made $445,000. Number one, that's an astoundingly bad box office amount. And number two, this is a wonderful way to teach math. <laughs> because I hate math. But, oh, man, I'll break down the per theater average for the Oogie Loves, no problem. Mm -hmm. I will do that math. But, you know, I, I, I've got to blame movies like Oogie Love because it's movies like that that makes a bucket of popcorn 30 bucks. Right? That's a good point. I, ugh, God damn it. I love popcorn, too. I have to have popcorn. I had a theater for a while. It was my theater, I called it. It was my theater. Because when I worked at the bookstore in Sacramento, California, literally we were right next to a movie theater. And eventually the manager of the movie theater saw me doing story time and said, hey, can you come and do story time at my son's school? So I went and did story time for her son's school and the teachers really liked it. So I kept going back to her to, to, to that school over and over again. And the, the theater, the woman who owned the theater was so, uh, 
grateful for it that she said we should keep teaming up so every once in a while i would have a story time at work and then immediately after work we would all just walk to the movie theater and we'd have a story time in the lobby nice of the movie theater and i'd be reading some book about some new movie that's coming out and they'd all they'd give out free popcorn and so the theater liked what i was doing so much that they gave me just an open pass whenever I wanted to go and see movies. And she would give me tickets for all the previews that they do. And so that was my theater and everybody knew me at that theater and I could always get in for free with my kids. And it was just, it was like a golden, it was a golden time for me. Like two years, two or three years of uh, free movies. And it was great. And I specifically remember when I, uh, that they were playing the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And I said, honey, you know what we should do? And she said, no, I know you. We are not going to go and see the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure in the theaters. And I said, but it's free. (laughs) We can go and see the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure for free. And she said, I'm not even going to pay the gas that it would take to drive to the theater and see the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And I said, but please, honey, this is historic. We have to go. And she said, no, you're not going to see the Oogie Loves. And I said, honey, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what movie the Oogie Loves is. Are you talking about the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure? And that's when she stopped talking to me. <laughs> but the we went to go see the next time we went to go see a movie there. Um the the manager lady was there and she took the tickets oh hi mr steve what are you here to see and i said yes i would like two tickets to the oogie loves and the big balloon adventure and she said ah and she told me that in the week that it was playing at that theater it played for only one week and in the whole week they sold four tickets and so and so that was just my joke. Anytime from that point on that I went to that theater, I always asked for, yes, I'd like to go see, uh, I would like two tickets to the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. They'd always give me these like dirty looks. And they're like, ah, I'm just kidding. Two for Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> so it, it, it this was a long time coming for me to sit down and watch the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And I hope you were not disappointed. I was not disappointed. But before we talk about the specifics, the subtle nuances within the movie, the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure, we need to talk about another legendarily bad box office movie because the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure is the biggest box office bomb of all time for movies released in at least 2,000 theaters. But there was another kids movie that had the record before the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure, and that was the 2000 an eight animated movie Delgo. Are you Delgo. aware of Sounds Delgo? Familiar. Um, it, it's a big sweeping epic animated movie for kids, mythical creatures, magic, good and bad, blah, blah, blah. But there were a shit ton of really big name people who were doing uh, uh, voiceovers for this. Um, uh, Freddie Prince Jr., Jennifer Love Hewitt, Val Kilmer, Roddy McDowell and Bancroft was in this movie. Nice. Okay. Um, Probably like her last movie. Yeah. It's been on Netflix for a really long time. A lot of people accidentally stumble onto Delgo. And I've heard tell that it's a pretty good movie. But before Oogie Loves, Delgo was the biggest box office bomb. Now, the numbers... It opened in uh, a little over 2,000 theaters. It cost $40 million to make. The director of Delgo was a huge uh, asshole. And he specifically said in Us Magazine, Delgo will outperform Shrek. And that reminded me of the line that Quentin Tarantino does in Four Rooms when he says... The less a man makes declarative statements, the less apt he is to look foolish in retrospect. (laughs) Because the total box office of Delgo was $511,000. 
And when you break that down, that averages to about two people per showing of Delgo. It did pretty bad. So it, it, it took a lot for something to beat the Oogie, to, to beat Delgo. But the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure had that. Yeah. So watching Oogie Loves, because I had watched it off of Netflix, as I'm pretty sure you did as well. You uh, mean watching the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. Continue. There was no big balloon. <laughs> and you know sometimes you'll you'll watch something on Netflix and it'll like kind of create a new category for you. Yeah. Yeah, so so after I watched Oogie Loves, <laughs> it had said because you watched Oogie Loves and then right underneath it it was just what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> so now now I'm having problems with Netflix because of this movie. We we might break up. You know. My Netflix is already kind of messed up because sometimes I'll just put something on for the kids on my account because I don't care. So every once in a while, it'll be like, hey, Steve, would you would you like to watch Naughty Stewardesses or perhaps Jake and the Neverland Pirates? So my my. Would you like to watch uh, Clifford's Kite Adventure or perhaps uh, Ninfo Ski Bunnies? So I have a very bipolar Netflix account because of my kids, and it's not it's not pleasant. But here's the thing. Here's well, but, the thing. But, but yeah, well, I have the same problem because I will watch something like Oogie Loves, and I'll also watch Oogie something loves like. Big uh, <laughs> I'll also watch something like Bear Nation, you know, or which is about gay hairy men. Um, yes. Or or any other strange thing. There was a short time where Netflix created a special category for me that was just random selections. And I was <laughs> just like, yes, I fucked Netflix up so bad. They don't know what to they don't know what to show me anymore. Just like, here's just some random shit that you might you might like it. You might not. We, we have no idea what the, what the hell's the matter with you. You broke Netflix, basically. <laughs> that was a very, very nice. proud, proud time in my life. You should be proud of that. That's pretty awesome. Random selections. <laughs> the thing the thing about the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure is that it's a really, really hard... It's a bad movie to watch. Gawker specifically said, quote, I watched it in the hopes that it was so bad it's good. It is not. It is so bad it's infuriating. <laughs> And that's a really good explanation of the movie. It's a hard movie to watch. But the thing that, that troubles me is, uh, much like The Lone Ranger, on paper, I do not think that The Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure is that bad of an idea. In the sense that there's a lot of interactive kids TV that's out there right now. So someone had the idea of, well, let's make an interactive kids movie. And I... Uh, he just went about it the wrong fucking way. The one point that Jeannie brought up, which I think is is really kind of sums things up a lot, is is who exactly was this movie made for? Okay, because uh, it to me it really looks like it's pitched to uh, well, definitely it's made for children, but it looks like it's really pitched to a child like about Maxwell's age. Yeah. Okay. Now, if that is the case, why do we have the bouncing ball popping over words when a child that age can't read? Another thing, too, is that they really want you to sing along with everything, despite the fact that a lot of the words won't appear mm -hmm. to the songs that you're supposed to sing along to. Like, uh, hello, movie. I don't know this fucking song. How am I supposed to sing along? So I have another list, and I really, I really found this to be intriguing. Um, I, it's just a, a small history of interactive kids' television. Some very random examples of interactive kids' TV. Um, it really starts off in 1953 with a TV show called Winky Dinky and You. I was going to bring that one up. Really? 
Yeah, you just <laughs> grabbed that right out of my childhood. Yeah. Yup. And you would buy the magic trans- screen. Yeah. yeah. That would connect to the television where you could help the people with their apparently the show was canceled because kids just started literally coloring on their television. C- connect to your television is is way too grandiose for what this is. This was just a piece of plastic that stuck on your television screen because of the static electricity. Yeah. <laughs> and then you would you would draw on it. Another uh it, like after that the the biggest example of interactive kids television that I could find uh which is one that I remember growing up uh Captain Kangaroo in 1978 and specifically picture pages mm-hmm. where you would buy or you would order a workbook and then Bill Cosby would show up in random episodes of Captain Kangaroo and say okay well today we're going to work on page 58 and so you turn to page 58 in your picture pages and you would do the page along with Bill Cosby and afterwards he would rape the shit out of you (laughs) well we're done with our picture pages hey kids why don't you take this special drink and the next thing you know, you'd wake up in a hotel room in Burbank and you were naked. You know, why? Tell me, please, why am I not surprised that somebody who was always so dead set against using any kind of profanity in his act and putting on a TV show or actually even several TV shows that were just wholesome family entertainment would become a mad serial rapist. I never realized that, but yeah, Eddie Murphy had that bit about Bill Cosby getting angry at him for using curse words. Oh, that's really interesting. I never realized that, that yeah, he was so uh, wholesome. Yeah. Yeah. And people wonder why I am very, very mistrustful by people who present themselves as, like, good people. Yes. As well you should. You should never trust good people. They they literally terrify the crap out of me. Every time I run into one, it's it's just like there's something up here. Yep. You're, You're acting this way, and somehow that's going to hurt me. And I agree with that. You should I'm never trust it. Correct. No, you you definitely are. Oh, I wanted to tell you. I wanted to tell you. There's one character in Oogie Loves um, that I I don't want to say attracted to because I don't know the age of the person who played the character. I know who you're talking about. And Jubilee I, Rounder. And I think I felt the same way. I'm like I, I, I kinda think I kinda think it's it's the um it's the hottest girl in Denny's theory. You know? Yeah. You go to yeah. a Denny's and you see this this hot girl and she's not really hot. She's just hot relatively to the other mutant waitresses that are working yeah. there. Yeah. So yeah, and I kinda just- felt yeah, I even turned to just Jeannie to, and I was like, uh, just I, to make sure, sure we're on the same page, yeah. we're both talking about Cloris Leachman, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, ever since I've seen her as Frau Blucher, I've, I've, I, I, I've wanted anal. And she went from Young Frankenstein. And I wanted her to perform it on me. To the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. Uh huh. Jesus. <laughs> That's 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 a really bad career trajectory there. I've I've actually so, just sickened myself with that idea. <laughs> so I I really was attracted in a sense to specifically the character's name is Jubilee Rounder and she really likes squares. Yes. So I thought that since well. It, I'm trying to find some way to 
explain myself, but I'm just going to get to it. I Googled Oogie Loves Porn. Okay. You know what? Actually, so did I. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. When was the last time you've Googled something and Google said, I got nothing? When was the last time you've ever Googled something and Google says, you know what? There is nothing on the internet for that. <laughs> uh, because it's Google. Google is this big giant monster, but to be able to Google something and to have Google go, nothing, got nothing. There, there's, <laughs> there is nothing in existence for this. Yeah, especially when you can Google something like effeminate Nazi hairdressers and you'll come up with some sites. Yeah. But, yeah Oogie Google loves porn was too much for Google. <laughs> I love that. So what were we doing? <laughs> oh, yeah. Interactive kids television. Yes. Um, 1987. Um, there was a TV show called Captain Power. I did not recall that being uh, interactive at all. Um, it, it wasn't interactive unless you bought the really expensive toys that Mattel bought. To go with Captain Power. This is Captain Power, not Captain Planet or any of the other captains. Captain Power was set in like a in like a post-apocalyptic future. And he had this suit of power and he fought these bad guys. But you would buy these toys and the toys would interact with the television show. And Captain if Power was a lot more like, yeah, fuck the environment. Yeah, yeah, Captain Power didn't care about the environment. It was already scorched from the post-apocalyptic uh, future that they were in. So he didn't care about the environment. Now that but I had a toy for this. Familiar. The toys are sounding I had, familiar now. I had every toy for Captain Power. Yeah. I had every Captain Power thing imaginable. It was Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. It lasted for one season, and then that was it. And the bad guy was Lord Dread, and he had the Bio Dread army. And if you bought a good guy spaceship, then every time a bad guy showed up on the screen, you would shoot at them and get a point. And even if you bought the, the bad guy ship, you could shoot at all the good guy characters, and you'd get a point for that too. So it was a very... It, live action and animation and interactive. And I was absolutely obsessed with it. It was one year of my life. And I loved this show, but it was canceled and I've never gotten over it. Any, any reason why it was canceled? Was it because he was such a bastard to the planet? I have, I have no idea. I have no idea why it was canceled. I think it was because it, it cost too much. Possibly. I, I think I'm going to let myself believe that it was because Captain Planet was also a, a serial rapist. Captain Power, not Captain, Captain Planet. Captain Power, oh man. Yes. So then after Captain Power, um, in 1996, uh, Nickelodeon made Blue's Clues. It was a highly interactive show. All of the characters would look directly into the camera, talking directly to the audience and have a conversation. It was a huge, huge, huge show, and it changed the landscape of children's television. Uh, Steve was the original host of Blue's Clues from 1996 to 2002, and then he left and his brother Joe took over from 2002 to 2006. Now, my name is Steve, and I have an older brother named Joe. So I love it when people are talking about Blue's Clues, because anytime you get people talking about Blue's Clues, they always say the same thing. Oh, yeah, Joe's OK, but Steve is much better. <laughs> Steve is so much better than Joe. Joe was OK, but Steve, Steve was was more real, more funny. Joe, Joe, Joe was too serious. Steve is so much better than Joe. And I, I, I always just sit there and go, yes, yes, Steve is better than Joe. Why don't you talk some more about, why don't you talk some more about this? And say it slower. Yes, say it slower. 
say it softly. While I, while I pinch my nipple. <laughs> so, uh, Blue's Clues lasted from 96 to 2006, but what, and it was a pretty big monumental show, but Dora the Explorer started in the year 2000 and is still going on. No, no, it's a horror show. Jesus, Bella. More than a kid show. You you shut your trap. You love Dora the Explorer. I hate it. You loved it. You used yeah, to I love it. You used to love it, but now it's a horror show for me. Now it's a she, now. She used to jump into Bella's defense. She used to love it, but then she grew up. Yeah. yeah. In the in the first season or two, it was supposed to be kind of like Blue's Clues, but it was supposed to be like a you were playing a video game on your computer because Dora would say, where's the tree? And literally you would see a cursor on the screen, click on the tree. And then Dora would go, oh, there it is. But eventually they lost the cursor and it was literally just, you know, another blues clues where oh. Dora was talking to the screen and that's still going strong. And see, now see, that surprises me. I, I could have sworn I heard that Dora was uh, deported. Nope. They're still making new episodes. It has the record right now for the Nick Jr. show with the most episodes. They just did like the 200th or 250th episode or something like that. So now, thanks to Blue's Clues and Dora the Explorer, there are about a bajillion ripoff interactive kids shows on TV. My my son, Maxwell, really likes Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, and I'm OK with that. Because Mickey Mouse Clubhouse is essentially just Blue's Clues and Dora, but with Disney characters. And it, my daughters didn't have Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, but I still found it bizarre that most kids know all of the Disney characters, but don't really watch any of the cartoons. It's like kids are literally born knowing who Mickey Mouse is. Yes, this is true. It, Mickey Mouse has kind of become ingrained in in the American DNA. Yeah, and it's really weird. So at least I can say, oh well, Maxwell knows who all of these characters are because of this show. I can pinpoint that. But when Emerald would just go, oh, that's Donald Duck, and that's Goofy, and that's Pluto, and it's like, how do you know this at all? Maxwell was obsessed with a show called The Color Crew. It's on Netflix. Ooh. It is laughably unwatchable it is the absolute it, oh it's it's like the oogie loves in the big balloon adventure of children's television shows it's 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 almost impossible to watch it is horrible it's amazing i love it i hate it it's so bad oh my god you love the things that you hate Weird. yes i love the things that i hate i'm a complicated that's, man bella that's why you're still around kid right <laughs> Burn! Drops Mike. So I, I've got some. Re I, I I read a lot of reviews for the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure, and there is a specific one that I found interesting. Um, I hope you do not take offense to this. Oh, please go ahead. Okay, Grady Smith of Entertainment Weekly said that the film, the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure, was so bad that the film will no doubt garner the attention of, quote, tripped out drug users and snarky bloggers. <laughs> and I thought, how did he know about us? Because <laughs> he nailed us there. Grady Smith of Entertainment Weekly. He might be psychic. I, I, I've actually watched Oogie Loves both high and straight. Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. Oh, yeah. Continue. Yeah, yeah, and and even <laughs> even drugs do not help this movie. Oh God! But but like Delgo, because Delgo was created by one guy who went around saying, "Oh, this will be the biggest movie of all time. Everyone tremble before my power." There is one person to blame for the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. His name is Ken Weisselman. That's Ken with two N's. Ken. 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 Ken Weisselman. He's a toy. 
He's a toy licensor and a marketing guru. He's the guy who is responsible for bringing Teletubbies and Thomas the Tank to the United States. He's not a director. He's not a writer. He's not a producer. He's a toy licensor. And apparently I, 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 I read a lot about this guy and he's a nut job. He's very self-absorbed. At one point he called himself the Madonna of toys. <laughs> That's really sad that that, that, it that depends exists. on what toys we're talking about now, doesn't it? <laughs> like, are you seriously proud of that? I would consider that an insult, but he also talks uh, about himself in the third person a lot. He seems like a real big narcissist. He specifically said that Oogie Loves was going to, quote, redefine family entertainment as we know it and completely change the movie theater experience for the world. Well, I think he was probably correct in that statement because any anyone who may have seen Oogie Loves in the and the Big Balloon Adventure Thank you. The theater with their kids now hate their children. Um, so it, it, it I, I would call that a game changer. Yeah, that's a good point. He said in a number of interviews that he came up with the idea for the movie after going to see a showing. And I think this is pretty racist, but he went to go see the movie. <laughs> Medea goes to jail. Okay. And he was. And he was surprised by how many people in the theater were yelling at the, the at, at the screen and offering advice. So basically, he saw black people in a theater and decided to make a movie about it. <laughs> I think I, I think that's pretty racist, but whatever. Um, there's a really interesting interview with Weisselman. Uh, that he did after the movie came out. Uh, he did it to uh, promote the DVD release of the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And it, it's a really interesting interview because he basically blames everyone else for the oh, failure of this. Yeah, he blames just everything you can think of. He And he keeps saying that the reviews were all unfair because they were comparing it to other films. And he said, well, the reviews were bad because the people who were reviewing them, they were old men and they watch movies for a living. And so they're going to see movies like Schindler's List and then going to see my movie. Well, I didn't make this movie for you. He said, quote, I never said we were making another Argo. <laughs> like he thinks that the reason I, I, he why really he got bad reviews is because someone went to go and see like chariots of fire and then saw his movie and said well this isn't as good as chariots of fire bad review but he really hit it because there are a lot of similarities between oogie loves and the big balloon adventure and schindler's list yeah and argo mm -hmm. yeah. he also said that most of the reviews out there are people who didn't see the movie which i thought was bullshit but um, while trying to find out more information about this weirdo asshole, Ken Weissel, Kenan Weisselman, I learned that uh, it, it, this January he announced, and get ready for this, two sequels. Two sequels. That he's filming back to back. They, they already have names. Uh, the Oogie Loves and the Big Family Adventure and the Oogie Loves and the Big Holiday Adventure. And although they haven't gotten a, uh, a network yet, there will be a TV series. Mm, see, he's going in the wrong direction. I, I would go with Oogie Loves and Toofy Secret Chain. Nice. That's, that's the Oogie. How can he have such an ego when, when he has made a movie that has parents taking their five-year-olds to doctors and saying, is it too late for an abortion? He, you know, how can he be <laughs> proud of that? Uh, be, I don't know. I do not know. Oh, uh, yes, no, Maxwell. What is, what is, what is this? What is this? 
I have no idea what you're saying, Maxwell. Wedding the dis. Wedding the dis? Dis. Are you speaking in slang? Is this jive? Like in ziz. 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 This. Ziz. This. Maxwell goes gangsta. This. 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 I. I. Oh God! This is the Oogie loves of conversations. <laughs> I'm I'm a big fan of the Onion AV Club, so I I know that they had done a review of it. So I, I looked it up on the Onion AV Club, and I was happy to see that Nathan Rabin reviewed the movie for the 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 thing he used to do for the Onion AV Club called My Year of Flops. He spent a year watching all of the movies that bombed in the box office and tried to figure out, did the movie bomb because it was a bad movie or was it because of other reasons and it's actually a really good movie? Could this be an undiscovered gem or is it just really, really bad? So he went to go see the movie. Uh, he, he was in downtown Chicago and he had to drive like two hours to find a theater that was playing it. It was two weeks after the movie had come out. And the theater owners tried to dissuade him from seeing it. <laughs> the, the, the people actually said, you know, we do have the Avengers. <laughs> or something to that effect. I don't remember specifically. They might have been Avengers, but. Uh, but he he has a quote about the movie and about the characters and it's a popular one because I keep seeing his quote appearing in a bunch of other different reviews and stuff for Oogie Loves. But this is what he said. And this is wonderful. I want this on a bumper sticker because it's amazing. But he said about uh, the character in the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure, he said, quote, demented, demonic jesters out of a pneumonia ravaged toddler's agitated fever dream. Oh, man, that's a hell of a quote, yeah. That's a quote about the characters in the movie. It can also be used to describe every insane clown posse album. <laughs> or my Catholic school. Either one. So are, are you suggesting that the Oogie Loves are Juggalos? Possibly. Possibly. I could see the Oogie Loves... Uh, Ooh, ooh, ooh! I'm gonna, I'm, I'm starting to, to, to pay attention to this sort of thing. We have long sis, since passed the length of the movie The Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. This podcast is now going on longer than the actual movie The Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And we have barely started. And we have barely started because I'm, I, I just got onto my second page of notes here. This is the part where I talk about all of the different characters in the movie. So there are three Oogie Loves. Now, Toofy, I'm pretty sure, is the leader of the group. You think Toofy is the leader? Yeah. Toofy is the, the purple-skinned one. With the vanilla haircut. Hair. Yeah. Do you think that Gooby is the leader, the nerdy one, the I like would, I would go with Gooby, yeah. In the Onion in the Onion review, they said that Gooby was the Mike Nesmith of the group. Well, I would consider Mike Nesmith the leader of the monkeys. Yeah. So, yeah, so so there we go. You know, I so, I I can't see a leader of a group who can't keep his pants up. Oh, oh, I'm, you know, I'm changing the lives of young people here in Shawnee, Oklahoma, because when I first put on the movie, uh, when I first put it on to watch it, Bella said, what is this? Is this another bad movie? I'll try and watch it with you. And Natasha wasn't around. And then Emerald and Amber came home from school and I said, hey, kids, sit down. Bella and I are about to watch the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And then Emerald, being smart, said, oh, hell no, and dropped all of her stuff and ran directly to her room. <laughs> Slammed the door. And I said, Emerald, why don't you come? No. She, she, she stayed in her room and then that was it. But Amber, who is kind of like my... my um, 
unofficial third daughter. Mm -hmm. She's Emerald's age and she's more outgoing. So she said, what are you watching? And I said, it's called the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And it's supposed to be really horrible. And she said, "Okay, I'll sit down. And so she sat down and she watched the movie with us. And it was really surprising that. um, She did everything that the movie told her to do. She's she's 13 and she's in eighth grade. But when they told her to stand up, she stood up. When she told her to sit down, she sat down. She yelled everything back at the screen. She was having a, herself a good old time. And so when two well, that's, fans, that's, that's really the difference between your daughter and not your daughter. Yes. You know, very Emerald, much. Emerald is definitely at the age where everything you do embarrasses her. Yes, but but to other people, I'm like hilarious, Mm -hmm. just not to my kids, but to others, I'm hilarious. And so Amber was super excited to watch the Oogie Loves the Big Balloon Adventure. But when Toofy makes the unwise decision to not wear a belt and his pants fall down the first time, uh, Zuzi, the female of the group, says, "Okay, Toofy, but every time your pants fall down, we're going to say, Goofy, Toofy, pick up your pants." And right there, I said to Amber, "I'm going to start saying that every time I see some gangbanger with his pants down, because I hate that when you see some like, uh." A ghetto person. When you see some ghetto person with uh, pants so low that you see their underwear, yes, and because apparently that's like a cool thing. This is this is. I now, told him now that you've brought this up. This is forcing me to go on a a serious non sequitur, um, because I'm sure you have probably heard or seen that they are now kind of saying that the whole pants sagging thing was a code in prison for how yes. willing you were. Can, can anybody read that and not think that that idea is just total horse shit? Just total, yeah. When did prisoners become so polite when raping a fellow inmate that they're, <laughs> oh their their pants are pulled up too high? I I can't I can't rape them in the shower. Yeah. Seriously, no. I do not believe that for one single second. Well, I'm really, I'm really proud of how I'm changing the lives of people here in Shawnee, Oklahoma, because apparently a couple of days ago, Amber was at school and there was some like a cool guy in eighth grade walking around with his pants really low and Amber really loud stared at that person and yelled, Goofy Toofy, pick up your pants. <laughs> And I really do think that this could catch on just nationwide, that we all embrace the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. And whenever you see somebody's unwanted ass crack Mm -hmm. or you see some dude with uh, baggy pants that you just say really simple, goofy toofy, pick up your pants. (laughs) And that that could be a, a big cultural thing. We can all start doing that. Goofy Toofy, pick up your pants. We might have to try that. Very much so. Um, I really do think that this could take off. But I but wanted now, to talk. But now, even after yes. the first pants falling incident, Toofy still feels that it is unwise to wear a belt. Yes. In fact, I'm writing a paper about it. I'm writing a scientific paper. It's Toofy in the process of poor decision making. Yes. 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 It, I'm going to have it published in a scientific journal. So far, I only have 50 pages on it, but I'm hoping to to have it a lot longer by publication time. Yeah. But I wanted to talk about the characterization of the different Oogie Loves. Gooby, he's the smart one. He has glasses, green skin. He's an inventor. Mm-hmm. He has he he likes pickles. His catchphrases are scientastic as well as go for Gooby. <laughs> now, Toofy, he's the lovable free spirit. 
he his catchphrase is adventurific. He is more of a of a go and do it sort of a person. Now Zuzi has a vagina. End of characterization. Yes. She she is responsible for getting the other two Ugi loves coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And then she gets a smack on the ass and says, people say, thanks, toots. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's really upsetting to me that there are so that there can also be so many other uh, films, TV shows where you could say something like this. Oh, well, this character is a free spirit. This character is scientific. And then here comes the girl. What about me? What's my character? You have a vagina going like pink over there in the corner. <laughs> well, what should my characterization be? What should I be? Nothing. You, you love flowers. Now go over there and put on a pink outfit. You're a girl. And by the way, we're going to pay you a lot less for being in this movie. Yeah, it's stuff like that really just upsets me because I have daughters. It's really messed up. She also has some some catchphrases. Her big catchphrase is um, the, she has two big catchphrases. Number one, sparkalicious. Mm -hmm. And number two, the Bible is a lie. We need another Holocaust. <laughs> she says that throughout the whole movie, just. We need to find the we need to find the balloons for Schloofy's birthday party. The Bible is a lie. We need another Holocaust. And now we're back to the Schindler's List connection. Yeah, exactly. They they're also in a band. Yes. Like the Oogie Loves band. Usually it's it's not that big of a band. They just get really drunk and they do a lot of Pink Floyd covers at dirt bars. This is this is true, yes. Just a lot of really long jam band versions of time. This movie seems to be less written and more created via committee. Just like how Kenan and Weisselman is a marketing guru, it looks like this movie was just this movie is exactly what happens when the executives try and be creative. You really think that much thought was put into this movie? It, it, yes, I, I, I feel like I feel like this is the Saturday Night Live 1980s version of uh, uh, a kid show. I, I kind of feel like it was more like, all right, the cameras are rolling, do something. Well, there are other characters that in this movie that we should talk about. Yes, um, what about Jay Edgar? Now, tell me this movie is not trying to send secret messages of some sort. I have not fully deciphered it yet, but you have a, a vacuum cleaner character named J. Edgar Hoover. To be fair. Pretty much masterminding the whole thing from behind the scenes. To be fair, I, I watched this movie more times than I would like to admit, and the, the character's name specifically is J. Edgar Edgar. It's J. Edgar Edgar. It's not J. Edgar Hoover. No, it's J. Edgar Edgar. I want my, I want my pen. But, Seems like then it might be a little bit of racial profiling on my part, and I do have the podcast to forgive me. Uh, well, it J. Edgar Edgar it is a talking vacuum, and and see, there's a pun there. There is a subtle pun, and I'm not sure if you realize it. So let me take some time to describe the pun. See, J. Edgar is a vacuum, and there was a famous person named J. Edgar Hoover. Right. So like J. Edgar Hoover, the character of J. Edgar dresses as a woman. <laughs> yes. And hates commie bastards. Mm -hmm. And speaks and works directly with a safety. Satanic window. Satanic window. window. <laughs> Wait, window. say that again, Maxwell. Window. That's that's a pretty good. Uh, you can't pronounce satanic that well because you're only three. Okay, come over here, Maxwell. Try it again. Say satanic. Tanic. That's just tanic. There, I don't think that's a word. Tanic. Satanic. Satanic. Well, it's the acid that's in. 
See, I'm saying say tannic. So he's saying tannic. He outsmarted me. Maxwell just worked circles around me logically. Satanic. Tannic. Ah, oh, you're so smart, Maxwell. Man, I just got served by a three year old. Now, Shloofy. I'm so, is... I'm, I'm so going to have to tell Jeannie that story when she gets home. She's going <laughs> to love it. Well, that's a really good. Uh, that was really good. And Maxwell and I just did like a classic comedy bit. And it is a piece of gold. <laughs> it is. Shloofy is a Lucha, pink. Lucha. No, Maxwell, I'm not Lucha fighting you right now. I'm trying to do the podcast. Shloofy is a pink talking pillow. Uh, who has a birthday coming up. So be sure and get Shloofy something. And here's a weird part. Apparently, Shloofy dreams of himself dreaming about himself. Shloofy was a very, was probably the most mystical of the characters in this movie. For, for really? reasons just like that. Well, I don't know. I'm a big fan of Windy the Magical Window. That that, that window was evil and satanic. I, I'm, I'm she had a you. southern accent, and she maybe this was me, but she did seem she sounded like she was slutty. Uh, she sounded a little slutty, and and I did get a bit of a chub on because of that. Um, hey, Sloofy. But, but in the in the first few viewings of Windy the Window. The curtains were getting put down. They stopped after a while, but in the first few, the the wind, the curtains were getting progressively darker, and I was expecting to see that through the whole movie until she, you know, ripped the hearts out of the Oogie Loves and ate them. That would have been quite a twist. That is the ending that I was personally expecting. I was kind of disappointed that that is not the ending. Spoiler! Spoiler alert! That is not the ending that we got. Well, I'm pretty sure that that was the original ending that Stanley Kubrick had in mind when he envisioned the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. Because Windy was a representation of the fact that the moon landing did not happen. Exactly. This movie... Windy consistently scared me every time she came on screen. Um, much in the same way that Trinity from the Matrix movies scared me, yet aroused me at the same time. Oh, wait, wait. Hold on. Maxwell has to tell the podcast something. Yes, Maxwell. All right, then. Thank you for that, Maxwell. For that insightful commentary on the Oogie Loves. How, how, how do you spell that? I am a P B B B B B B T. I believe is how you spell that. Oh, you got to tell him something else. What else? Oh, okay then. And another thing that bothered me about Windy the window, she's a magic window. Why isn't she a magic mirror? Because I think that magic mirrors are standard. Does does Windy the window? Is she like? an outcast in the world of magic mirrors then i think a case could be made for that because you know even though she was a window i i kept seeing mirror yeah you know, I, I kept thinking it's a mirror freaking windy the window oh and let's not forget ruffy the grumpy fish yes i i was i was actually quite relieved that the fish did not have a black man's voice. Yes. That was yes. something going into the movie that was really kind of terrifying me, that this was going to be probably the most racist character on the face of the planet, and to give Oogie Loves credit, they didn't go there. And another thing, too, this movie has an awful lot of chanting. And I have yes, it does. Which again brings about that satanic element. Yeah. One, two, one, two, three. Windy, window, what do you see? 
There's a lot of chanting. Well, that's that's the thing. That's that's another thing is that you you actually had to perform a chant, you know, to entreat the magic mirror window thing, so that it would show you stuff. I pass. You know. Sooner or later, you would have to be sacrificing a goat down below the lower sash of Windy Window. Are we back? I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I fucking knew it. I fucking told you. I what? Did you I knew tell it. me? I knew it. I spoke for 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 those listening. They may not realize that our internet connection just dropped and was just broken. And I know for a fact that it's because I was speaking ill of Windy the Window at the time, and she reached out, used her satanic powers, and caused the blackout in your house. Maybe it's because we weren't appeasing the Oogie Loves gods by chanting enough. I think we need to, needed to do more satanic chanting. Bella, that's not how you chant to the god of Oogie Loves! Don't you say shut up to me, you furball! The Oogie Loves is tearing this family apart. That is the power of Windy the Window. I thought I, that I, I, I am I am now entreating all of our listeners to be very, very cautious. Yeah, yes, be very cautious about Windy the Window. The thing the thing is though is that I think that most of the magic pieces of glass are magic mirrors, but the fact that Windy is a magical window probably makes her like a LGBT member of the world of magical pieces of glass and that possibly she's maybe shunned by other magical pieces of glass. like magic mirrors are like oh that's windy the window we need to treat her differently so do you think maybe that think that's that, a shame do you think maybe that is what made her so bitter and turned to evil Another thing, too, can we talk about the fact that a giant talking vacuum cleaner has a crush on a magical window? Isn't that weird? Yeah. That, that, I mean, there's a lot of weird things about this movie, but that was one of the most uncomfortable parts. <laughs> that is weird. That is weird. Um, there were quite a few uncomfortable parts. There were so this one. There were certain this jokes, and I can't remember any of them offhand, but there were a few jokes that were definitely intended for the parents. 
which yeah. really wound up coming off really, really wrong. Yeah. Like that one time at Milky Marvin's Milkshake Manor when Chaz Palminteri shows up and just starts killing everybody. Yes. Gangland slaying. Like, like Sonny being killed in The Godfather. Suddenly there's just dead horse heads everywhere. And rip the, rip the fins right off that fish. Yeah. So there are a couple of lines in this movie that I thought that because nowadays ever since ever since uh, look look out the lever Maxwell come here come here and say look out the lever look out the lever the lever poop I didn't it's not the lever poop the lever ever since that specific episode of our podcast I've been looking for really good lines that that sort of Explain the whole movie, and I've got a couple of them. Amazing. Okay. I really hated Tony Braxton in this movie as Rosalie Rosebud, the the singer who's full of herself. Like, like, stuck up bitch. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she was acting. She was a. Uh, she was definitely batisting it up in this movie. But I love the fact that when she's about to sing her beautiful song, that. You know, there's a small period in time there where um, she had to feel absolutely horrible about agreeing to this movie. Because once she starts the movie, she says, I wrote the perfect song. It's called Scratchy Sneezy Cough Cough. Yes. <laughs> and I love that line because there's no way to say that bit of dialogue without wanting to kill yourself. I wrote the perfect song. It's called Scratchy Sneezy Cough Cough. And I'm like, ah, you had to, you got paid to say that in a movie. Ah. I also, um, I was really creeped out by uh, uh, Carrie Elways in this movie, who played the part of Bobby Wobbles at Trippy's Trailer and Truck Stop. Because it, he really went all out for his performance. He had he did an extremely hyperactive performance. He went all out for his weird, bizarre little part, and you really do have to give him respect. I won't, but somebody has to. Respect. I I, I don't know. I, I every time he was walking, I got the feeling I got the feeling that he just had gotten out of a nineteen eighties bathhouse. <laughs> but he says do you like bubbles like so excited as if this is like a new f fetish that i don't know about you know <laughs> do you like bubbles well gosh are you in the right place kids can you not lucha in the room while i'm trying to do the podcast if you guys are gonna lucha then go lucha somewhere else okay because i'm trying to record the podcast maxwell Shh. Okay, don't be so loud. Also, Jaden is sleeping, so try and be uh, quiet. Okay. You don't want to be quiet. I know it's hard to be quiet. This podcast is super, super duper. Bella, you keep trying to say really nice things about the podcast during the podcast, in the hopes that you will be pulled for a quote in the beginning of, no, of the episode. True it. or false? Oh, yeah, I'm going to say this boring. What this you, podcast is super... Mm. What are you trying to say? This podcast is super absorbent? No. This podcast is super awesome? Super califragilistic cool. espialidocious. That was the word you were ah. trying to say? Yes, shut up. Fail. <laughs> Do you like bubbles? So they go on this big, huge uh, balloon adventure... They meet Cloris Leachman in a teapot in a tree. Now, didn't didn't she look a hell of a lot like Phyllis Diller? Yes, yes, she did. She did. I really did like a uh, jubilee around her. I think it was because her pants were so tight. Can you not kick me in the crotch while I am trying to do my podcast, Maxwell? Okay, 
please. I know you're upset because you love nothing more than to kick me in the privates, but if you could not do that, okay? Please. Daddy needs his privates for private things that are private, okay? Hey, hey, hey. Leave Maxwell alone. He's upset because he can't kick me in the privates. So then they meet Chaz Palminteri. Like, really? He was in the usual suspects. <laughs> yes, he was. He was in a Bronx tale. That's a great movie. And like I told you in a in a phone conversation, right after Oogie Loves, I had watched that Chris Rock movie, the name of which escapes me. That Down was, to Earth. Yeah, which was basically a remake of uh well, Heaven I've Come Wait with Warren Beatty from the eighties or the seventies, I'm not really sure. Uh and it was very strange because because first off, that movie started off with a lot of really bright, garish colors and bad jokes. Oh, this is my book. And within the first ten minutes, there he comes, popping up. Chaz, what's his face? Palm and Terry. Yeah, he comes popping up in the movie, and I'm like, this is the same movie. Oogie Loves has not stopped. This is like a direct sequel. Oogie Loves too. Yeah. So if if you do watch Oogie Loves, you do need to watch Down to Earth immediately after. You do. It it's it's a real good follow up. Oh my god, it was strange. No, because they're gonna be here in a second. So you can't. I'll be out there. So I I was trying to figure out why Chaz Palminteri was in this movie, and I came up with two theories. Number one, the number one reason why I think that Chaz Palminteri was in this movie is they they said, hey, Chaz Palminteri, we want you to be in this movie. And he said, no. So then they said, but we'll let you sing a song. <laughs> and he said, yes. I was actually in a play. I was in a children's theater production of uh, Charlotte's Web. And they wanted some of the bigger parts to be played by adults. And they wanted me to play Rizzo the Rat. And I said no. And then they said, well, we'll let you sing a song. And I'm like, okay, if you're that stupid to let me sing a song, then yeah, sure. So I was in the play solely because of that. So I thought that might be the reason uh, why they got Chaz Palm and Terry. The number two reason why I think he was in the movie just like John Travolta and Scientology, they just have some shit on him. <laughs> well, my my personal theory is that uh, not specific to him, but for pretty much everybody who was in this movie, they're all pretty much um, actors and actresses who have been around Hollywood for years and in the past have done some very good work and are kind of down on their luck now, either through uh, meth addiction or, or sexual <laughs> scandal or anything like that, where they're just not getting the kind of work that they used to, you know, because really even Christopher Lloyd, what's the last thing we've really seen him in? And, and this is just their way of, you know, kind of like when you win an Oscar when you haven't really made a good movie that year. It's just that, yeah. you know, they got to give you an Oscar before you die, you know. This is kind of the same thing. It's like, you know, be in the movie, we'll give you a check, and you won't have to eat cat food for a little while. How sad. How sad. Because there are some people in this movie. There are some serious people in this movie. And then there are some not-so-serious people. <laughs> I was really upset. I was really upset. Um... Because it's like, okay, well, this is a pretty horrible movie. I don't see how it can get worse. But then when they go and find the fifth and final balloon, it's up a windmill at Great Grass Lake. And first they have to deal with a serious punk-ass llama mm -hmm. that's just talking a bunch of smack. But then right after that, the entire movie takes a quick left turn into racist town. <laughs> And you meet Lola and Lero Sombrero, and they live inside of a giant sombrero 
Uh, Lero Sombrero speaks only in bongos. And apparently Lola Sombrero speaks only in a fake Russian accent, which makes no sense. But um, the only way to power the giant sombrero is to salsa dance in unison. And that was the point where I had almost reached my limit for how much Oogie Loves I can watch. Like once I got to the scene where they're having to power the giant sombrero with salsa dancing, I was like, okay, maybe I can just stop watching here and say I had watched it all. But because this is it it was too much for me. Yeah, that's that's pretty serious. But now a quick question about Lola. Yes. Would you tap that? Oh yeah, I'll, I, absolutely, absolutely. You know who else would uh, tap that? Uh, Ruffy the Grumpy Fish, because they kind of made out a little bit there. I wouldn't be surprised if Ruffy actually did tap that. Well, you know he's got those lips, because frankly, those lips kind of attract me a bit too. Yes, yes, they're DSL. <laughs> they're DSL lips. <laughs> This might be the first and only time in the history of mankind that that has been said about a character <laughs> in the movie The Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. Speaking of uh, DSL, I really uh, uh, perked up when Gooby said, the enormity of its growth is mind-boggling. I, see, now that's, that's what I was, that's what <laughs> yeah. I was talking about earlier. Like, that thank you. you. You know a line like that was tossed out for the parents' sake to try to keep them interested in watching the movie. But how creepy is that? It's very creepy. It was amazingly mind-boggling creepy. Like, oh my god, you shouldn't have said that. Ever. Ever. It's like, hey now. The enormity of its growth is mind-boggling. Thanks for noticing, Gooby. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. This I, might be... I, I think I think we should take just another small break here. Okay. To collect ourselves yeah. and then get into the final lap of Oogie yes. Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. All right. So We'll be back. Um, we'll be back, l- listeners. They're burning. They're burning. Ah! They're fucking burning. Uh, the bomb film. Oh, Jesus. Jesus Christ. You, you listen to this. You like this show? I hear the screams. I hear them. I can hear the screams. Come on over to the bomb film. Why? Why? Find us. In the iTunes stores, a searching undead cow. My eyes! My eyes! My eyes! Come on, come on, Phil! <laughs> My toenails! My toenails! Are we back? We're back. Officially? Okay, uh, yes. Oogie Love. Now, 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 here's the part that really pisses me off about the Oogie Love, okay? They go on. Guys, stop luchaing. They go on this big balloon adventure to find the balloons for Shloofy's birthday party. I feel ridiculous saying these things, but I'm, but that's just that's just the movie we picked this week. Mm-hmm. So they they find these balloons. They go to they find five different balloons. Big huge adventure. And what do they do? They lose all the fucking balloons again. Yes. Like Had how, me scared. Like, seriously, you lost them again? But then you get the line, oh, there's only one force stronger than wind. Yes, there is. Love. That Love. touched me. That touched me. That touched, that touched my balls. It, it, it almost made me throw a shoe through my television screen. So you have to blow kisses to get the balloons back. You conceited bastards. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It's like I have to praise the movie mm-hmm. to get the balloons back. It's not my fault. I didn't lose the balloons. I just spent an entire movie finding. 
Yeah. So at the end of the movie, you learn that they're apparently a cappella balloons and they sing a song for Shloofy. The This whole movie, this whole movie reminded me of Leonard Nimoy. In what way? Because actually, I, I have his, a tie in here. Go ahead. They, Leonard Nimoy is rolling in his grave uh, hearing me say this. But um, as a callback, we did that, that episode. We did the episode, the Leonard Nimoy tribute episode for the movie uh, Baffled. Baffled, yes. It, which was a pilot that wasn't picked up. That's what this feels like. This feels like that it should be a television show, but for whatever reason, they did a movie instead. If this was just a half hour television show, then okay, then it might be fairly successful and run for a while. But to have it be a movie that you think is going to change the face of television, they got to change the face of movies and uh, movie theaters will never be the same and all that shit. It, 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 this should be a television show. Yeah. And I like the concept of a of an interactive movie for kids. Unfortunately, Kenan Weissman, Weisselman is an asshole and did it absolutely wrong. But this really did feel like Baffled for Kids or uh, Puchinski for Kids, that this is just a pilot for a well, television show. I can see in my head the Oogie Loves television show. What I had thought is when it concerns the balloons that much like Leonard Nimoy, the balloons looked uncomfortably Asian. Yes. Yes. Uncomfortably Asian. Like the, uh, like, like the aliens in the beginning of star Wars episode one. Yes. As you know, our blockade is perfectly illegal. The beetle or slug creatures, whatever they were, with the, yes, the Cindy Lauper voices. Yeah. yeah. As you know, wonton soup is perfectly illegal. Man, I, I am sorry for this movie this week. Like, I apologize. That was a difficult film to get through. That was a tough one, but it was a necessary one. It was a necessary film. Well, you know, that which does not kill us makes us stronger, you know. Yes. And that is, is Oogie Loves is exactly what Nietzsche was talking about when he wrote that. Well, stop closing the door and we can't open it. The thing that's upsetting is that I think that the general idea of an interactive children's movie that kids can stand up during and jump around and interact with the screen, I like that idea. And somebody had to do that idea first. I'm just worried that the person who did it first totally fucked it up, and now no one will ever do this again. <laughs> because the concept is a fairly strong one. I would, I would like... I think that this is something that can be done a lot better by someone else. But you know how Hollywood is. Someone has to be the first to make a movie. And if it succeeds, then there's a bajillion copies out there. Yeah. But if it fails, then Hollywood just goes, oh, well, we'll, we'll never do that again. I am well. Yeah, Hollywood gets, also gets a lot more like, oh, you love? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. that was a movie? No, I was not involved with. Yeah, I, I I disavow any knowledge of Ruby Loves whatsoever. Mm. I really do hope that the sequel, the Oogie Loves in the Big Family Adventure, you really finally get to to learn more about the man they call Ruffy. The man called Ruffy. Yeah, yeah the man called Ruffy. Um, that learn about his tragic backstory. Mm -hmm. And his his tortured psyche. Yes, you know who I I might be mistaken about this, but I I'm pretty sure that for the next movie for the part of Ruffy, Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck. Okay, that's a good ben choice Affleck. for a sequel. What I would really want to see out of a sequel is um is Windy the Window uh, trying to 
topple and destroy the teachings of Jesus. If you wash Wendy the window, is that considered sex? I would think it would have to, and I would think there would be a lot of giggling involved. How can there not be Oogie Loves Porn? There's porn for everything. <laughs> Seriously, Google, step up your game. Damn. There's got to be some stuff. I'm going to bing it. I'm going to Alta Vista this shit. Alta Vista, oh my god. There's got to be something out there. Boom. Oh my god. Wait, is this Oogie Loves? No, this isn't Oogie Loves. Damn it. No, I still don't have anything. So, oh, so no Oogie Loves porn. We might have to, like, like email Vivid directly. Maybe. You know, maybe they're not might aware. Have to. You know, they, they maybe they don't have their thumb on the pulse and they're not aware of the need. I'll have to, I might have to start, uh, I'll work on the script right now. I'll start, I'll immediately start working on the Oogie Loves Porn. The Oogie Loves Porn site. Okay. I, 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 and about halfway through the movie, I had become, I had become very despondent when I realized that the Oogie Loves weren't real, and they were full-grown people in styrofoam costumes. Their mouths I think that's still a, move. I, I think their that's mouth, a misrepresentation. Their mouths need to move. Why aren't their mouths moving? That was the part that I found the most disturbing. It's just, can't you make them at least look like they're talking? And their eyes should not be so dead and lifeless. Like little yes. porcelain dolls. Who keep on dancing long Seriously. after the music has stopped? Seriously, how long is this is this podcast? Is is this our longest podcast we've ever done? Uh, is our I'm podcast not sure. It's done? sitting at about two hours, I would think, right now. Really? Yeah. Wow. Because I I'm. I'm I'm not sure how I'll feel if our biggest if our longest podcast was uh for the Oogie Loves. <laughs> you know? I'd be both proud and frightened of that. I I would feel the same. I, I am I am in agreement with you on that. Although to be fair, this has been a kick ass episode. <laughs> This has been a damn good episode of our podcast. I am looking through to find out what our longest one is. And I get, I it's full the, top. Yeah, I came to the realization last week because Natasha said, it's like, so are you done with your podcast? And I said, yeah. And she said, you know that your podcast for Wolf Cop ran considerably longer than the movie Wolf Cop. And I said, oh, <laughs> you know, I, I never... I never thought about it that way before. And then I, that's when I turned to her and I said, you know what that is? Respect. Respect. <laughs> we are respecting the movies. Like, uh, like uh, Mr. Lobo says in Cinema Insomnia, uh, they're not bad movies, just misunderstood. No, screw you, Mr. Lobo. Some of these movies are really fucking bad. <laughs> really, really Fucking bad. But you know what? I will respect them. And that's what that's what I think that we have in this show. We have respect for these movies. Oogie Loves, this was pretty goddamn bad. But I spent a ridiculous amount of time researching Oogie Loves and reading interviews and learning about these characters because that's respect. I respect the Oogie Loves in that The Big is, Balloon Adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what this podcast is all about. Respecting these movies. Respect. I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm slapping my chest. A even, sign of respect. Even though some of the movies like Oogie Love will require therapy after watching. Oogie Love's a big adventure. Yes. 
But yes, there is respect. Yeah. There, there are deep seated scars associated, but respect. I cannot show this movie to Maxwell. Maxwell will fall in love with this movie. Maxwell, you're not allowed you're not allowed to watch the Oogie Loves, okay? Aw, yeah. he got upset. You hey. can't watch it, Maxwell. You can't. I'm not gonna watch this every day. Impossible. That, now, Wolf that Top. is you wanna watch Wolf Top, Maxwell? No. You don't want to watch Wolf Top? Do you know what it's about? It's about a cop, and he's also a wolf. Wolf cop. Wolf cop. But now this is only ensuring that Maxwell, when he turns 20, will rediscover Oogie Loves and start showing it to all his friends. And that is where it becomes the cult sensation of his generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cult sensation. I would see this at midnight. I would see this at midnight in the theater. I would definitely do that. So so it's possible that uh, Maxwell may have to watch Oogie Loves to prevent that from happening, but I'm kind of picturing that Maxwell would have to watch it in the way that uh, Malcolm McDowell watched the movies in, in Clockwork Orange. Nice. Yes, very much so. If his vice and things forcing his eyes open. If, if Maxwell watched it now, then he would just... This is repetition. I like repetition. I want to watch this again and again. <laughs> yes. He has to be old enough to realize that it's horrible mm -hmm. when he watches it. So he's not there yet. No. He will be eventually. <laughs> not now. So, so yeah. Maxwell being basically the target yeah, age for this movie is we are finding that this movie is not age appropriate for him. No. No, I think it is age appropriate for him, which is why I'm not showing it to him. <laughs> so I'm not getting stuck watching this over and over again. Not happening. Do you have any ideas for next week? Yes. And it's going to be a very difficult, uh, another difficult show you know what after a hey, oogie loves and the movie we're doing next week i i really need a vacation we might have to watch the big lebowski or something that is easy because next week uh the movie that we are going to be doing i've already started researching it's going to be a very difficult one um the 2014 christian drama god's not dead okay Starring Kevin Sorbo and Dean Kane. The the acting genius Dean Kane. Yes. It also uh, stars Shane Harper, who plays the hunky boyfriend on the Disney show Good Luck Charlie. <laughs> I know you don't know Good Luck Charlie, but I know Good Luck Charlie. I've got daughters. I, I know Good Luck Charlie. <laughs> Oh my god, it, it, next week is going to be a difficult one because I don't think that I can do a Christian film without talking about my feelings regarding uh, organized religion and freedom of religion. Oh, I and think we should tear that shit up. <laughs> Christianity in America, and it, it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be an entire episode of asides. I'm going to take an aside to talk about how much this pisses me off. And then that's going to lead me into another aside about how it, it, I hate it when people do this. It's going to be an, an aside within an aside. It's going to be an inception, like inception, <laughs> but with insides, asides. And what may be our most controversial episode yet? Yes, next to the Oogie Loves and the Big Balloon Adventure. Because that was a pretty controversial episode. So God is not dead. I I, I am there. I, I have been waiting to see this movie. I've been holding it off for the podcast. I have heard commentary on this movie before. I really think we're gonna we're gonna tear this one up. God's not dead. For those of you who are unaware, is a 
porn movie for Christians. Yes. It's a Christian film for Christians about how Christians are right and everyone else is wrong, and it allows Christians to see a Christian movie and feel Christianly. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's with, Christian porn. With with a lot of warped logic to make their beliefs make some kind of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, I, I'm, I'm going to get so upset next week. I, I think this is going to be gold. Yes, it's definitely going to be gold. It's I'm just going to be gold. Uh, going to work on my on my breathing now for next week. I'm going to work on my calm breathing now. You had homework, didn't you? Yes. Yes, Bimbo's Initiation. Yes. Okay. Bimbo's Initiation. 1931 animated cartoon, Bimbo the Dog. It is the movie Saw, but for children in the 1930s. Yes. And I, I am going to make a suggestion that is, yeah. that is not any kind of official homework or something like that. But I do think that if you're going to watch God is Not Dead... Uh, a movie that would go quite complimentary with that, and I've mentioned this one to you before, maybe a good time to roll back. The movie Haxen, which is an old Norwegian silent film, basically about worshipping Satan. Okay. So I think Here's that a, might be complimentary to God is Not Dead. Another complimentary film to go with God is Not Dead, Three on a Meat Hook. Three on a Meat Hook. Yes. Ow, ow, ow. Maxwell, stop little, hurting my privates. My privates are getting dogs. attacked. We keep oh, on ow. dancing. Yeah. Long after the move, move, music has stopped. You do, you do the voice a lot better than I do. I have watched that trailer like a million times. Jeannie has watched it like a million times as well. It is my... I, I, I never thought in life I would have a favorite trailer. But by hands down, Three on a Meat Hook is my absolute favorite trailer. I, I have not yet, but I keep meaning to find out who that narrator is and track him down and just say, you know, thank you. Thank my you. Favorite, my favorite trailer, hands down, is uh, the trailer for Jackie Chan's Rumble in the Bronx. Yeah. Because it, Rumble in the Bronx is a fairly bad movie it's just a really bad script and really bad acting and it's obviously not in the Bronx but in Canada but the people who bought the rights to this movie they realized how are we going to sell this Jackie Chan movie I know by we are just going to show them the insane fighting and nothing else <laughs> and it's just and I can hear the like drums playing in my head sometimes when I when I rumble in the Bronx. Gee, 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 gee. Like I can hear it in my head. That's my favorite trailer. <laughs> but three on a meat hook, that's a damn good trailer. I, I, I worship that man now. How can he make that movie that piece of shit movie sounds so good? <laughs> Okay, if you're not going to do uh, the combination of Three on a Meat Hook and the Oogie Loves, then I will. I will absolutely do that. What are you talking about? Uh, combining the movie Oogie oh, Loves oh, okay. with the narration for Three on a Meat Hook. In fact, I think I might work on that tonight and see what happens. Cool. I, I, I think that could be damn entertaining. Yeah, I'm gonna work on that. <laughs> well, Jeannie is home, loves. so I need to wrap up so that we can be together. Yeah. So Back until up. next week, I am Bunny Williams, and I am Reverend Steve. And with me occasionally is Maxwell Galindo. Maxwell, say goodbye to my podcast. Okay. Come over here and say goodbye to my podcast. I don't think that my podcast can hear you. Say goodbye, podcast. See you next week. Bye, guys. See you next week. That was adorable right there.
See you next week, you godless heathens. You have to give Bella her shot. She's not in the room. She's outside playing on her bike. Oh. <laughs> say, say bye, you godless heathens. Bye, you godless heathens. That, that was not even close, Maxwell, but that was good. That was cute. You get a gold okay, star, go. okay? You get an E for effort, all right? Ooh. Yeah, high five. Ooh. See you next week, everybody. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>